Bonkers Baerbock, the unhinged green foreign minister of the ailing Federal Republic of Germany, actually issued a Ramadan message this evening in which she said that she was heartfelt sending a signal to all those in Gaza suffering from Hamas terrorism. It is unbelievable the tone deafness of these Western politicians. They imagine that the 112,000 people who are either dead, maimed, mutilated, or buried under the rubble inside Gaza are the victims of Hamas rather than the victims of their ally Israel with their full support, economic support, political support, cultural support in the Eurovision Song Contest, military support with weapons and intelligence overflights and all the rest. They really seem to believe that, that anybody in the entire Muslim world wants to hear a Ramadan message from the foreign minister of Germany blaming Hamas for 112,000 murdered and mutilated Muslim people. I'll tell you what, Germany, get rid of this woman. She's making your country a laughing stock as well as an economic basket case. Germany, the powerhouse of Europe, is now the sick man of Europe as a result of following the orders of senile butcher genocide Joe Biden, to whom I now turn. Joe Biden, who could, with a single phone call, tell Israel to open the gates and allow thousands upon thousands of fully laden trucks full of aid, some of it now spoiling. It's been standing out in the Sinai Desert for so long. He could phone Netanyahu and tell him, open the gates or there won't be another dollar. There won't be another dime. There won't be another bomb, another gun, another shell, another air force, another piece of diplomatic maneuvering on your behalf in the United Nations. Open the gates. No, no. Joe Biden thinks that anyone's going to buy his solution that a thousand American soldiers go to the Gaza Strip. What could possibly go wrong, Joe? What could possibly happen to your thousand soldiers? If the Israelis don't kill them, the Palestinian resistance will kill them. A thousand American soldiers to the Gaza Strip, a raging war zone, to do what? To build a harbor which will take six to eight weeks, they say, so that they could sail aid directly into the Gaza Strip. Why didn't anybody think of that? It could have been done any day, sending barges from the ships onto the beach. We don't need a harbor. And anyway, maybe you've got an ulterior motive for your harbor, Genocide Joe. Maybe you want to build that harbor so you can steal the oil and gas in the sea off Gaza, which belongs to the Palestinian Authority. Maybe you want to do in Gaza what you are already doing in Syria, in the parts of Syria that you remain in illegal occupation of, looting them of their oil in great profusion. The Pope has told Zelensky it's time to hoist the white flag. Q outrage amongst the NAFO brigade all over the world. But what His Holiness is saying is enough is enough. Ukraine has lost this war. Hundreds of thousands of people have lost their lives in this war. Hundreds of billions of euros and dollars have been wasted on this war. And the only result of continuing to fight it is that more and more Ukrainian territory will be lost. More and more millions of Ukrainian citizens will fly to other countries as refugees and settle there. Not much liked, they will come to be amongst the public that they have been dropped in amongst. Trust me on that. 
And remember, you heard it here. All the Pope is saying is enough is enough. Who will doubt it? Who is going to call for the continuation of the fight to the last drop of Ukrainian blood? Has enough Ukrainian blood not already been shed? Any losing cause? Any war that need never have happened, should never have happened? Any war that was provoked, not by the Ukrainians themselves, but by their NATO masters? Washington declared the war over the dead bodies of Ukrainians, a proxy war against Russia, and they were open about their war aims. They wanted to regime change Moscow. They wanted to break Russia up into what they call its constituent parts. Not one Russia, but a balkanized Russia, dozens of Russias, little statelets, that they could maneuver and conspire within, turning one against the other, having all build a state, an army, an air force, having all build all the paraphernalia of antagonistic states. They didn't hide it. That was their intention. And the fact that they didn't hide it is the principal reason why Russia has prevailed. If you tell a country that you intend to break it up, that you intend to pick its government, that you intend to redraw its borders, that you intend to feast upon the dripping roast of its economy, what can that country do but fight back? They underestimated Russia. They underestimated President Putin. They underestimated, above all, the Russian national unity that has now prevailed to the extent that the Pope is calling for Zelensky to hoist the white flag. I've never seen such a tidal wave of anti-Catholic guff in my life on social media as that that has followed His Holiness's call today. Maybe he could have put it better. Maybe he could have avoided the illusion of the white flag, but the essence of his message is surely clear and unanswerable. The longer this is stalled, the worse will be the outcome for the remaining rump Ukrainian state. Meanwhile, little Macron threatened Russia this week that an advance on Kiev or Odessa would bring French troops into the war. Well, I thought he was a historian, Macron, but he obviously has forgotten what happened the last time French forces poured into and across the Russian steppe. Napoleon beat his retreat from Moscow, a bedraggled and defeated figure. The idea that the French society, riven from head to foot, most of them, 75% of them, against their pretender, their Dauphin, little Macron, are going to fight Russia for Ukraine, for Odessa, was always a non-starter. And quickly, the French armed forces made it clear that no such thing would be happening. But the fact that these raving fantasists in the chanceries of Europe, in the presidencies, in the prime ministerships of Europe are still entertaining in the face of all the facts that they can intervene in this proxy war directly and not suffer a total defeat. I've only got one word to say to you, and that is Oppenheimer. Take it in. Hear what I'm saying. By definition, if Russia is facing an existential threat, it will use every weapon in its armory. And if there are no red lines for Macron, there will be no red lines for Moscow. It's obvious. Oppenheimer's going to win all the Oscars. Quite right. Great film. But nobody seems to have calculated that the nuclear weapons Russia would land on Paris are 1,000 times more powerful 
than that monstrosity you see on the screen behind me that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You want that? You want some, Mr. Macron? Well, the French people don't, and they need to rise up and tell their president so. The rest of the leaders in Europe, Schultz, who's committed acts of self-harm against his own people, against his own economy, Macron and little Rishi Sunak, about whom more later, who couldn't fight his way out of a wet paper bag, who's never heard a gun fired in anger, unless on the grouse moors if they allow people like him to come hunting with them on the grouse moors. Somebody would ask him for a gin and tonic, trust me on that. Little Rishi Sunak, little Grant Shapps or Grant Green or whatever he's calling himself today amongst his multiple aliases. Britain is a country whose flagship aircraft carrier caught fire again this weekend that has a fleet of warships that crash into each other in the Solent, that can't join the war games for NATO, that can't send their commitment to the Red Sea because their ships ain't up to it. Britain's a country with an army that could fit into Villa Park, the home of Aston Villa, where they got humped by Tottenham Hotspur today. These fantasists, these gnats, these fleas threatening an elephant, of course are only doing what Mussolini did. It was said of Mussolini that he went around the world threatening people with Germany's army. That's what little Grant Green is doing. It's what little Macron is doing. It's what little soldier Schultz is doing. They're threatening people with America's army. But the Americans don't want war either. That's the meaning of the virtually total collapse of the presidency of genocide Joe Biden, who, quite apart from all his other failings, which include, of course, his failings of actual cognition, of actually knowing where he is, what year it is, what flavor of ice cream he is eating, where the toilet is, and why you should go to it when you need rather than after you've done it in your pants. This man is the leader to whom Macron, Schultz, Sunak are bowing and scraping when he's not fit to be sent out for a loaf from the even tide home that he should be spending these last years in the twilight of his life in. And the American people ain't wearing it. Joe Biden's ratings have fallen to the low ever recorded by any president in office seeking re-election in all history. And his opponent is half mad himself, Donald Trump. I mean, it's not as if he's facing some insurgent Bill Clinton or Jack Kennedy. He's facing Donald Trump and he's facing the mother of all humiliating defeats. Unless, of course, they arrest Donald Trump before he gets to the starting gate. Unless, God forbid, they kill Donald Trump before he gets to the starting gate. The Democrats made a very big mistake in not moving Joe Biden out and bringing some kind of substitute other than Kamala laughing gas Harris in his place. Finally, I spent Saturday afternoon in what for me is a kind of heaven. I have been an honorary member of the National Union of Mine Workers since 1982. That's a long time ago. Two years after I became a member of the union, the epic, historic struggle between the miners and the Thatcher government began in 1984, exactly 40 years ago this month. 
I went to Doncaster. I went to the Hatfield Main Colliery. I went to the Miners Club there. I joined the march with brass bands and bagpipe bands led by a Scotsman from Fife who left 61 years ago and still sounds exactly like a Fifer. Many Scottish miners moved to the Yorkshire coalfield when their own pits closed for economic reasons in the 1960s. When I got in, into the club, just ahead of the leader, Arthur Scargill, there was prolonged and entirely spontaneous cheering and applause. Not because I fought every day of that strike. Many of the people there are soldiers and, uh, of that uh, dispute, of course, but most of them are daughters and sons of the miners that fought that dispute. They weren't cheering me. Because of my role in the miners' union, my support for their struggle from the first day until the last day and until now, they were cheering me because I had soundly thrashed the so-called Labour Party and the Conservative Party in the by-election here in Rochdale. They were cheering because they live in complete despair of Britain's political class. I'll be making my maiden speech on Tuesday. I'll be drawing on some of the things that Arthur Scargill said in his speech on Saturday about how our country has been systematically destroyed by our own ruling political and economic class. How our country has been de-industrialized, dis-industrialized, just like Germany is undergoing now. Before we entered that strike in 1982, we had a coal industry, a thousand years of coal underneath our feet. We had a steel industry. We had a car industry, a truck industry, a railway workshops industry, a motorbike industry. Our hammers flew, the sparks showered. We were a power still in the world and it has all been destroyed in the interests of globalized capitalism, in the interests of finance capital. Everything that happens in this country happens for the people with money, happens for the city of London. I'll be giving my speech on Tuesday in the budget debate. Look out for it. I'll be naming names. I'll be seeking to shame the guilty men and some women who are responsible for Britain's plight. I spoke to a man at my son's football today. My son won man of the match, incidentally. I spoke to a man sitting on the bench watching the kids playing football today. He said to me, tell them something. Tell them that we once had a country. Tell them that we once had a community. We once had a society. We once had things that were great. And now the country is a shithole and the political class are responsible for it. It's going to be the mother of all talk shows.